I think the first thing that one needs to say is that Buddhism is not a sort of monolithic thing. There are many different kinds of Buddhism, just as there are many different kinds of Christianity. Um, so uh, different kinds of Buddhism put different kinds of emphasis on different things. However, uh, there are certain things I think that most schools of Buddhism agree upon. Um, these were the principles that were laid out by the Buddha uh, in his first... I mean, traditionally, he, he achieved enlightenment and then gave a first talk which laid down the principles of Buddhism. And, and I think these are subscribed to by most Buddhist groups. Uh, and these are sometimes called the Four Noble Truths. Um, and the first noble truth is that life is, un life is where to find it is unsatisfactory. Um, the Sanskrit term is, uh, we experience dukkha, suffering, but it means general unsatisfactoriness. So everyone gets ill, everyone gets old, if they are lucky to live long enough, they have disappointments in life, they may lose children, relationships. Uh, this, this, this characterizes life for everybody. Um, and you know, generally speaking, this is not good. So we're unhappy about many things that happen in life. But Buddhism is not a pessimistic view because it also has a project, it has a diagnosis of why life is like this and how we can make it better. So in a sense, it's an optimistic thing. So the analysis of why life is unsatisfactory in this way is that when we experience this unsatisfactoriness, it's because of the mental attitude we bring to bear on the things that happen to us in life. Um, so if you can change the mental attitude you have towards these things, um, then you can make things better. So when, when bad things happen, we really want them to go away. When good things happen, we really want them to continue. So this is a mat matter of our mental attitude. And if you can get rid of this mental attitude, then you can face what life gives you with kind of equanimity and you won't suffer this kind of feeling of un unhappiness, this, this dukkha. And then <clears throat> the last of the Four Noble Truths is, is a bunch of things about how you can achieve this changing of your headset as it were. And it's to do with various practices. Some of these are sort of ethical about how you live. Some of them are kind of suggestions for how to understand the world. Some of them are how do you should temper your mental attitude, your mindfulness of the world. So these are a bunch of suggestions in which, which help you to change your headset in such a way as to make life make your mind more peaceful and uh, to not experience the, 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 the dukkha that we all experience without these. So what I've said so far may make it sound as though Buddhism is very self-centered in a certain sense. It's about getting rid of, it's about improving your own life, getting rid of your own suffering. And so that can make it sound as though you're not concerned about other people. Now, uh, if one were to leave matters at that, that would be very misleading. Because Buddhism has always been concerned with the suffering of not just oneself, but the suffering, the dukkha of other people. So the thought is that you know, th this, this experience of suffering is bad. Uh, and it's bad for anyone, no matter who. So uh, if you're concerned with getting rid of suffering, you should be concerned with getting rid of everybody's suffering. Okay? So compassion, karuna uh, in Sanskrit, has always been an integral part of Buddhism. And in the sort of later Buddhism, as it emerges in Mahayana after the turn of the common era, uh, it becomes the, the central Buddhist virtue of compassion. Now, um, having said that, I think it's fair to say that as a religion, Buddhism has always been more concerned with private practice than public practice. So, uh, typically, uh, people, if they enter the Buddhist Sangha, the priesthood, remove themselves from the world. They, they go out and do community service, etc. But the focus is very much on on looking inward, as it were. Um, the thought that if you look inward, then it helps you to look outward, and that's you know, sensible. But 
something we've seen over the last um, 60, 70 years, I guess, is um, a sort of new developments in Buddhism. And sometimes this is called the Engaged Buddhism Movement. Uh, it's associated with the uh, Vietnamese Zen monk uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, but the current Dalai Lama is also often put in this category. And what, what, what the movement says um, is this. Look, if you're concerned with suffering, um, there are many things which cause suffering in the world. I mean, maybe your headset is the most the thing over which you have some control, the most control, but you do have other, you do have control over other things in life. Uh, you can get your kids inoculated, you can give money to um, people who are starving in wherever, okay. And if you're really concerned with compassion for other people, you should do this. So, um, with the Engaged Buddhist Movement, we're actually seeing a movement into the, the greater world, as it were. And I think this is absolutely right. I mean, if, you're, if you have a feeling of compassion for people, you should be doing these things. So, I mean, Buddhism has evolved considerably over two and a half thousand years, and it hasn't stopped evolving yet. Uh, and I think the Engaged Buddhist Movement is a new development, which really picks up on something that's been there from the beginning, but actually makes a lot of sense, um, even though it hasn't been done before. So, so let's talk a little bit about mindfulness. So I mentioned that the fourth noble truth is sometimes called the Eightfold Noble Path, and these are strategies, hints, as to things you can do to uh, help you to reorient your, reorient your headspace. And one of these is mindfulness, okay. Uh, now, m what mindfulness is, uh, most fundamentally, is an ability to focus on something, to hold it in your mind, in such a way that you can analyze it, understand it, uh, and take consequences, take the consequences thereof. Um, this is not, I think, always the way that it's understood in the contemporary craze for mindfulness, because uh, you've seen mindfulness taken up by pop psychologists, even companies who give their employees courses on mindfulness. Um, and it's telling them something about how to relax, concentrate on their breathing, chill out, work more efficiently, etc. Um, and it is these things in some sense, but that's really not the main point that it's about. The main point that mindfulness is about is really being aware of what's going on in your mind and what's going on in the world as a consequence of your actions. So, first of all, if you're aware of what's going on in your mind, okay, most of us are not aware of what's going on in our mind. We don't really think about why we act as we act. We often fool ourselves. Um, so mindfulness says, well, hey, just think about why you're doing what you're doing. Just think about the emotions you have. Why do you have them? What's causing them? What are the consequences of your acts? Are you, when you think you're doing things for other people, are you really doing them for other things? Are, are other people, are you doing them for yourself? So look into yourself and analyze what's going on in your mind and be aware of that. Um, that's kind of looking inwards. But there's also looking outwards. So one of the things that Buddhism has stressed from the earliest times is this thing called Pratitya Samapada, dependent origination. So everything we do is uh, entangled in a network of causes and effects. And no one's going to disagree about that, but the ramifications of this are much wider than we normally think about. So suppose, for example, that I'm in Manhattan and I go and have a cup of coffee. Okay, a very ordinary, banal event. Let's just think about that. So the coffee I'm drinking, the beans were grown in a plant. 
probably in Colombia or uh, Costa Rica. So they don't come from Manhattan, okay. Um, the energy for the plant came from the sun. Uh, the water that grew the plant came from uh, the rain and the streams, okay. Then the beans were picked by someone who doesn't actually get paid very much money. They were transported by a ship, which is probably owned in a, another country. That ship was driven by coal, which was probably mined in a, a third country, okay. Um, and the sailors may yet be a nationality of a fourth country, okay. So then the beans arrive in New York City, they're ground by the distributor, who then sends them to their shop. And the shop has to comport with all the laws, both state and federal, of the people who work there and so on, the health regulations, the salary. The people who work in the shop, most of them are young, they're students, or they're, they're working at a sort of professional career, they're training actors or something. So, um, all these things have come together to make my cup of coffee, okay? So that's, you know, the causes going in. What about the causes going out? Well, you know, I, I chat with the people who serve my coffee. Um, and if, if I said something very rude to them, that puts them in a bad mood and they'll go out and be in a bad mood with somebody else. If, if I'm, I'm nice to them, if I'm pleasant, maybe that'll put them in a good mood. Um, sometimes we chat about what's happening in American politics. So uh, the conversations we have will change their thinking one way or another, who knows. Um, and then of course what, they're at, what they do will go and ricochet on their friends, their colleagues, their family. So there's this whole network of cause and events that this one cup of coffee is the node of. And if you think about it, and this is kind of good practice, just take anything you do in the day, right? And just think about how it's located in this cause of Pratichasana. And what you'll see is you have, you're integrally related to so much of what goes on in the world, not just around you, but in the whole world. So, I haven't forgotten mindfulness. Mindfulness about the world outside you is being aware of this whole causal nexus and the role that you play in this. So, if you are concerned with compassion, which you should be if you're a Buddhist, then you have to understand the consequences of your action on a lot of people. Next time you eat meat, think about, you know, not just people, but the, the animals. Think about the fact that they're brought up in this battery farming. Think about the abattoirs. I mean, you know, the things we do are implicated in all these kinds of practices and you Mindfulness is being aware of your role in this. Um, so mindfulness is important, uh, both internal mindfulness, as it were, and external mindfulness. And uh, I, I think this is absolutely crucial part of any Buddhist understanding. Traditionally, the aim of Buddhism has been to achieve enlightenment. And what that means is precisely that you, you get rid of this mental attachment to things that happen in life, and so you cease to experience the dukkha. That's enlightenment, okay? You can, it's not, and enlightenment is something you can achieve in this life. Uh, the Sanskrit word is nirvana. Nirvana means extinction, and it means extinction of suffering, okay? So perfection in the sense of completion is to bring the path to completion, which is to achieve enlightenment. Okay, now if you're a religious Buddhist, you think this is possible. Uh, if you're not a religious Buddhist, you may doubt this. Um, but certainly, even if you think that perfection is not achievable in this sense, uh, it's an ideal which is worth striving for, and most moral ideals may not be achievable ultimately. But nonetheless, the closer you can get to them, the better. So the more you can eliminate the suffering from your life, the better it is. Till now we've been talking just about Buddhism and differentiated. Um, but Buddhism is, is actually many things. I mean, it's a religion, it's a power structure, it's a sociology, it's a form of art, etc. Um, and I think most people simply identify Buddhism with a religion, or at least one kind, one of many religions, a kind of 
uh, Buddhism religion. Um, so if you subscribe to a Buddhist religion, if you've signed up as it were, it's called Taking Refuge, then um, you'll have most of the views that I've described, you'll have other views as well, but then you'll have uh, various religious practices. I mean, you will be a member of the Sangha, you'll maybe meditate, you'll go through religious services, you'll read texts, you'll maybe chant, depending where you are, um, and you'll subscribe to the power structure that you find in Buddhism. Uh, so these are all things of, of Buddhism as a religion, and, and, and that these are features they share with all religions. Okay. Um, but Buddhism also has a philosophy, and it's mainly the philosophy of Buddhism that we've been talking about now. And you may well be a kind of philosophical Buddhist without being a religious Buddhist. So you may think that the philosophical ideas of Buddhism, the sort of kind of things I've been describing, describing up to now, are, are very sensible, um, without wanting necessarily to be involved with a religion, um, so an institutional power structure, and so on. Um, and I think that uh, it's perfectly coherent to be a sort of philosophical Buddhist without being a religious Buddhist. You might want to be a religious Buddhist too. Uh, that will add a dimension to your practices and so on. Um, but you might think that the philosophy stands up in its own right without being integral to the kind of religious side of Buddhism. Uh, and I think, I mean, Buddhism is evolving. We've already talked about this. It morphed considerably in India, it morphed again when it moved into China and Tibet, um, and it's now moving into the West, and it's morphing again. So uh, there are many aspects of traditional Buddhism, uh, I think, which are going to be completely unacceptable to the West. One of these is this. Uh, traditionally, Buddhism, like all major world religions, has been highly patriarchal. Okay, there's never been a female Dalai Lama. Nearly all the heads of temples in Japan are male. Uh, even you know, traditionally, you cannot achieve enlightenment if you're a woman. You've got to you know play your cards right and come back in the next incarnation as a man. So um, this is not going to wash in the West, especially with the kind of person in the West who's attracted to Buddhism, who's generally educated and you know, has taken some lessons to heart from the feminist movement. Another thing that may well disappear is that, th that there's a lot of um, what you might call cosmology in Buddhism, a kind of uh, a set of views about sort of deities and rebirth um, and uh, a view of sort of the global cosmos which goes with Buddhism. Um, I, I think a lot of that is going to disappear as Buddhism goes into the West, because take, take rebirth for example. Rebirth is sort of taken over in Buddhism from the Indian context of the 5th century BCE. Um, and no, it's accepted by most Buddhists, I think, uh, maybe less so in the Chinese and Japanese traditions, but it's, it's always there. I, I don't think rebirth is going to find much sympathy in the West because um, we're too influenced by a kind of naturalistic scientific view. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the philosophical ideas that I've explained to you uh, didn't depend in any significant way on a lot of this cosmology. They didn't depend in any way on the doctrine of rebirth. They're about making this life better. Um, so you don't, you don't need this stuff. Maybe you want it for other reasons, that's fine, but I don't think you need it to make sense of the philosophical picture. And, and I rather suspect that what happens when, as Buddhism moves into the West, is a lot of these things which you might think of as cultural accretions from sort of Indian thought of 2,000 years ago are going to just sort of fade out of the picture. Um, at least in some kinds of Buddhism. I mean, maybe a distinctively Western kind of Buddhism will emerge. I mean, you know, just as a distinctively Chinese Buddhism, version of Buddhism emerged when Buddhism went into China. Um, of course, that's speculation about the future. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see about that.